Yeah, g'day, and welcome back to my Shelblin CNC lathe retrofit project. This week I'm going to try and make this a bit easier to use and test out a new interface. This is a manual lathe. It allows motion into axis. It's a very intuitive control interface. Whereas this is a CNC lathe. It has the same two axis of motion, but they're now moved by motors, controlled by a computer. Now so far I've got three ways that the computer can give the machine its instructions to move. The simple one is just jogging around. Now you can also set up uh, jogging wheels to do this, and I'm going to do that in a later video. But jogging around takes no real advantage of the whole CNC aspect of the machine. The second way of ordering the machine to move is using the MDI, the manual data input, I don't know. With this you've got access to all of the G-code commands like a GO2 feed rate move. Tell it to move the Z axis to position 200 millimeters. It's currently at 284 with a feed rate of let's call it 500 millimeters per minute. And off it goes. Using the MDI opens up some of the CAN cycles that are built into the G-codes, like multi-pass threading, so they're very useful. But MDI is limited to one line of code at a time, so if you're going to turn into a shoulder, for example, you're going to end up with the, the tool rubbing in the shoulder and probably chattering before you give it the next command. The third way to design a part is to model it in a CAD program, use a con computer-aided machining or CAM program to interpret the geometry into a set of G-codes, output that as a file, and then load it into your CNC machine. And they get the machine to run that code for you. The issue with this is it's quite a lot of work to, to model a part and then export a code, import it, test it, verify it, and then run it for a very simple part. And many lathe parts are very simple. When this lathe was designed back in the late 1970s, it only offered control through jogging or basically an MDI kind of interface where you recorded what you did in the MDI and then used that as a program. So if just jogging around isn't really the bee's knees and entering lines of code through the MDI can be somewhat error prone and doesn't really take advantage of the real benefits of a CNC machine. But modeling parts in CAD CAM is overkill for simple parts. What do you do? But there is a way, and that's called conversational programming. When Maho built this generation of CNC mills in the 1980s, they used a controller from Philips called the 432, and that already included a lot of basic geometries which you could just call up and program. Luckily for the Linux CNC community, one of the leading users and supporters of Linux CNC on the forum, Andy Pugh, has written a set of macros for all of the most common turning processes and given them a really simple to use interface to access them. You just download a bunch of files from his GitHub, put them into your configuration file. There's a set of macros which do the actual work and there's an any file a picture and a UE file and you have to link all of that stuff into your any file. There's a few different uh, lines you have to add that's all described in the thread which Andy's done. That, like this stuff, adding a new, t you add a new tab, add some, all of this code, it's all given to you, you just cut paste it, put it in there and that gives you this interface. Mail time. This drill chuck came up for sale on one of the German forums and it's brand new, so I figured, hey, that's me. The Rome Spiro are about as good as they make. Lovely little drill chuck. I'll need to make up a B16 arbor for it. And since on CNC machines, you normally drill from the cross slide, I think I might make up a stub arbor with a 25 millimeter shaft on this end and the B16 on the other, so I can mount it onto the lathe's tool holder. Making that will give me a chance to try out Andy's control interface. Now, to make this part, I'm going to need a bit of stock about 40 millimeters in diameter. But unfortunately, I don't have any steel that diameter. Closest I've got is this stick of 18159, which is a, probably a bit of an overkill. But hey, got it from the scrapyard, so let's just whack off a piece of that. Clean something out about here. My daughter came over and had a first attempt at welding. 
just about welded that to the table. Didn't take a long to get some quite nice looking welds. Man, I wish I'd hurry up and finish off fixing the gearbox on my bandsaw. So we turn on the machine and home it. Tool number one is already loaded. Now we're going to face that part, so we're going to the center line. Let's cut that down to 0.15 per rev, 0.3 depth of cut, no angle, and we want to head to our Z0 position. Tool 1 is the one we want to use, and a speed of 200. Let's try that again. Okay, I stopped that there because the diameter I need is already cleaned up and now I'm just wasting metal. That's our new Z0. To start with I'm going to go to minus 45. Okay, no end radius, tool 1, 200 millimeters per minute. Oh, and a final diameter, we're going to go to 50, let's go into 50. But no, we need a much deeper depth of cut than that, let's take a millimeter. Okay, here's our starting point. Because I don't have my variator and back gear control set up properly, I'm limited in my speed range at the moment, so I'm actually well under the design speed for this metal. I'm only done about 130, but man, that's a lovely surface finish. I'll let that cool, measure it, and then use that dimension to fine tune the diameter offset. So I just made, just checked and zeroed this micrometer off a standard, and we're cutting slightly undersized. The diameter is set to 50 millimeters. I'll just go and adjust the touch off. Call that 49.85. Now we'll do another couple of cuts and check it again. Wow, look at that finish. I'm starting to remember why I wanted to buy a Schaublin. Let's see if we can increase that depth of cut a little. That was taking one millimeter passes. Let's try taking twos. And let's go to an even number. Let's just jog it in a bit closer. And now let's go. Well that came out better than I expected because I didn't think it through. I didn't leave the insert a decent depth of cut for that final bit, but in actual fact it cut it nicely. Awesome. Considering I only got a bit over a tenth of a millimetre depth of cut for its last pass, that came out pretty darn well. Now I need to do the final shaft, which is length of cut. We're going to end at minus 35. And diameter, let's start by just taking it down to 30. Cool. 
Cool, that surface finish is still holding up despite the slower surface speed. I was taking this pretty slow, stopping and checking and measuring between each uh, pass. That's why there's a bit of discontinuity here. Okay, let's take a look. The final cut, we want to be 24.99. So the next thing we need is a chamfer. Wow, now that is a nice fit. Okay, to rough this down, we want to go to number turning to minus 28. Let's start just by going into 30. Two millimeter depth of cut, our 0.15, that all seemed to work quite nicely. We've got tool number one, tool set. Okay, let's go. Get a bit more coolant. Right, let's do a test, cut the taper on the end, test it out. Once I've got it to work, I can cut it again back to the shoulder. So the inner diameter is calculated at 14.31 and we've got a taper of 1.4307. I'll just check that. Yeah, 4307, which is the same taper as a number two Morse. Otherwise, everything else can be the same. I want no radius. It's going to go back to minus 28. The cutting speeds and feeds as before because they seem to work quite nicely. Okay, so this is where things started to go south. That first cut was actually slightly too deep, so the taper was a little bit too thin. That's okay, that is why I did the test cut further out. I figured I'd just extend the taper further back. But when I extended it back, I got a bit of a ridge. Tried extending a little bit further to take off the ridge, and then it rubbed. Now the problem with sneaking up on a dimension like this is I ended up rubbing because I'm not taking deep enough cuts. So I've switched out to an aluminium insert just to take these last very fine passes and hopefully clean up that bit. That insert had a different radius. I reckon that's not gonna clean up, is it? Well, I can try, see if this insert even survives this.
Okay, it's still slightly too small, but I might be able to save this. Luckily this is only a shoulder, so it really doesn't matter what dimension that ends up. I might take another two millimeters off it and hope that's enough to extend the taper to an adequate dimension. Moment of truth. Okay, I still need to shorten it. Now, since I can still turn it by hand, it's uh, not quite there. Oh, that's worse. My main mission for this week was getting those lathe macros installed, so I've got my conversational programming. That works really well. Thanks very much to Andy Pugh for designing that system and sharing it with us. It's brilliant. So what else did I learn? Well, one, man, this is a nice lathe. I think I already knew that. Two, I need to work on my machining strategies. Like sneaking up on this didn't really work with the first tool I was using, but then switching to a different insert for a finishing pass when I haven't already dialed it in, well, that was dumb. I'm now out of time. I spent most of the week working out how to install the lathe macros, so I'd better get this edited. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.